All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, I'm Andrew Dalton with the Adams County Historical Society in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This is our Thursday night weekly program. We're um, continuing to do these uh, remotely, digitally, and also some in-person programs that uh, we're going to be announcing soon, some walking tours of the battlefield that we hope you'll, you'll check out as well. But um, this is the uh, probably the most popular thing we do, which is uh, to broadcast every week and have a speaker talk about anything remotely related to Gettysburg or Adams County. And uh, tonight we are kind of in part two of uh, the series that we began last week with Jeffrey William Hunt talking about his book on the Battle of Bristow Station. Before I introduce him, I just want to uh, do a couple things. First, I want to thank the Dobbin House in Gettysburg for sponsoring all of our programs this year. Uh, I'm sure many of you have eaten at the Dobbin House in Gettysburg. Uh, it's just a wonderful business with wonderful people who support us uh, generously every year. And uh, also, if you have any questions throughout the program, please don't hesitate to type them in the box. I will try to direct them all to, to Jeffrey at the end of the program. And, uh, and finally, if you like uh, our program series and want to help support our efforts to preserve history here in Gettysburg, I hope you'll hit the donate button. It's quick and easy. It's the heart-shaped button at the bottom of this post. And then finally, one more plug. We have posted a link to Jeffrey's book in the uh, description of the video tonight. I hope you'll check it out, especially uh, the Civil War buffs who maybe have read a lot about Gettysburg, but not what happened right after Gettysburg. And that's how I'll segue into introducing uh, Jeffrey tonight. He is the director of the Texas Military Forces Museum in Austin, where he is actually sitting right now, as you may have noticed. Uh, he's also a professor of history at Austin Community College, and he served as the curator of collections and the director of living history at the Admiral Nimitz National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas. And he's the author of several books, including the one that he's going to be discussing tonight called Meade and Lee at Bristow Station, The Problems of Command and Strategy After Gettysburg from Brandy Station to the Buckland Races, August 1st to October 31st, 1863. Uh, so thanks once again, Jeffrey, for coming back for the third time to give a program to our loyal uh, viewers who are very excited to, to learn more about your work and your research and and uh, the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg. So I'll, I'll let you take it over. <laughs> all right. Well, glad to be with uh, all of you again. And uh, we will go over here and uh, share my screen. Uh, so this is, uh, as Andrew said, uh, this is a continuation of the talk that I did last Thursday on uh, my second book, Meet and Lee at Bristow Station, which is a part of a series that I've been writing on the war in Virginia from the moment Lee crosses the Potomac following Gettysburg through the end of uh, 1863. And so last time out, uh, we, we talked about uh, the, um, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, beginning of that book. So we sort of set the stage here. So let me just kind of go over that you know, really quickly. Uh, so after Lee uh, retreats over the Potomac, uh, Meade follows him. Uh, for 10 days, there's a duel uh, along the Blue Ridge Mountains with the Confederates in the Shenandoah Valley, the Federals in the Loudoun Valley, me trying to trap Lee in the Shenandoah, Lee trying to get through the mountains back into uh, Central Virginia, uh, and, and the Confederates prevail there. Uh, so at the end of uh, July, uh, the Confederate Army had taken a position in Culpeper uh, County, uh, and so uh, they're in, uh, in uh, what I call the Culpeper B, which is formed by the upper uh, Rappahannock River, which forms the northern and eastern boundary of Culpeper County, uh, and the Rapidan River, which forms its southern boundary. So it looks like a, a sideways V uh, with, the, with the mall opening toward uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains. The, the Federals had moved to Warrenton uh, because they needed to resupply from the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Uh, and having done that, Meade intended to push uh, after Lee to continue the Gettysburg pursuit uh, and see if the, uh, the battered rebel army would retreat. Uh, that doesn't happen uh, because uh, the, uh, the Army of the Potomac is told to hold up on the upper Rappahannock. Uh, it's it's get told that uh, by Union General Chief uh, Henry W. Halleck, uh, who tells me that uh, there's no way of reinforcing his army if it goes and gets in another big battle and has lots of casualties, and also that they're going to have to start pulling federal troops away uh, from the Army of the Potomac and send them north to uh, enforce the draft, where the New York draft riot is taking place and there are all sorts of, uh, of other problems. Uh, and this is going to hold the Army of the Potomac on the upper Rappahannock River uh, for six weeks. And in those ensuing six weeks, there's a big debate 
uh, between Lincoln and Halleck on one side and Meade on the other about what the Army of the Potomac should do. Uh, Meade wants to abandon the Orange and Alexandria Railroad as an axis of advance because it points toward no strategic target. Uh, it runs entirely to Confederate territory. He's already spending 5,000 troops to guard it uh, between uh, Warrington uh, and the Potomac River. And the further south he goes, the more troops he has to deploy uh, to defend that line against guerrilla raids. And that weakens the combat power of his army. Uh, Lincoln and Halleck disagree. Uh, they believe that Meade's job is to go out and finally fight him wherever he is with an eye toward destroying the Confederate Army. And they believe that won't be any harder to do on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad uh, than any place uh, else. Uh, and uh, so it's a very complex relationship. It's somewhat dysfunctional. Uh, Meade has been forgiven for not destroying Lee on the north bank of the Potomac at Williamsport following Gettysburg, but uh, Halleck and Lincoln haven't forgotten it. And so they, they have doubts about their general. Meade has doubts about uh, how well he's, uh, he's thought of uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so this is what's going on uh, throughout August uh, as both the Army of Northern Virginia, which has now pulled its infantry behind the Rapidan, and the Army of the Potomac recover from Gettysburg. So at the uh, beginning of September, both armies are as strong as they were on July 1st of 1863. Out west, however, uh, you have Rosecrans advance on Chattanooga, which ultimately forces Jefferson Davis to detach the first corps of the Army of Northern Virginia under James Longstreet and ship it west uh, to reinforce Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee, which is trying to defend that critical uh, railroad hub for the Confederacy. Uh, the shift of these troops uh, is uh, a problem for Lee. It reduces his army to, uh, to two thirds of its normal size and he only has 55,000 men. Uh, and he's got them along the south bank uh, of the Rapidan River, uh, and most of the fords here are fortified, and most of the high ground is on the south bank of, of the river, so that if you are looking into Culpeper for the south bank, the, the, the ground here along the river is lower than it is along the south bank. Uh, Lee had left Jeb Stewart's cavalry, and Culpeper is sort of a buffer uh, between the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern uh, Virginia. Uh, but once rumors of Longstreet's departure reach Washington, D.C., uh, Meade gets orders to find out if, if those rumors are true. So on September 13th, he sends its cavalry corps uh, into Culpeper County. <clears throat> this produces the Battle of Culpeper. Uh, it's a two-day-long, very hard-fought cavalry action that pushes Stewart's cavalry south of the Rapidan uh, and into uh, the arms of Lee's infantry. Uh, and after that, uh, the uh, Federals are certain that Longstreet has gone, uh, but obviously Lee still has the core of Richard Ewell and A.P. Hill uh, along the river. The question is, is Lee uh, intending to fight for the Rapidan, or if threatened, will he pull back uh, closer to Richmond now that his army uh, has been uh, weakened? Uh, and so Meade asked uh, Washington if he should mount an offensive. He's still operating under the orders to stay put on the Rappahannock. Uh, this leads to more dysfunction uh, between uh, the Washington administration and, and Meade. Uh, basically, they don't give him a direct answer. They kind of leave him hanging out there uh, to, to do what he thinks is best and to take the consequences, uh, good or bad, for what happens. And so Meade decides to advance his infantry into the Culpeper B, which he knows is a weak position. Uh, there is no good defensive terrain in Culpeper County uh, on which you can anchor both ends of a battle line. Uh, the county at its middle, uh, where the Orange and Alexandria Railroad bisects it, is only 23 miles wide. Uh, and so if you fight a battle here and you lose, uh, before very long, you're going to have to retreat across a difficult river. Uh, and those river fords uh, are natural bottlenecks. If there is a heavy rain, they'll disappear. Uh, and so there's always the chance that a beaten army will get trapped against a river and, and largely destroy. Uh, and so Meade doesn't like being in the Culpeper B, but now that he's there, uh, he knows that he can't back up. Politically, uh, that would be unacceptable. There are congressional elections that are about to occur. Uh, a lot of the balloting will take place in, uh, in October and then more will take place in November. Uh, and so a retreat uh, at, at this time would be uh, very bad. Uh, so Meade, although he still doesn't have clear instructions from Washington, understands that they expect him to undertake some sort 
of offensive action. And obviously, since the Confederates are massed along the Rapidan and all of the fords are heavily fortified, a direct frontal attack is impossible. So he's either got to go around the Confederate right flank or he's got to go around the Confederate left flank. And he knows a lot about this area here to the east where the Battle of Chancellorsville had been fought, but he doesn't know anything about the ground out here uh, in Madison County. So uh, Meade sends his cavalry out there to reconnoiter. Uh, this is going to produce the Battle of Jack Shop on September 22nd. Uh, the federal cavalry finds out what it needs to know, uh, but even as it is in Madison County, the Battle of Chickamauga has uh, broken out in northern Georgia. Longstreet's troops arrive in time uh, to help defeat the Army of the Cumberland and force it to withdraw back into Chattanooga, where Braxton Bragg is eventually going to place it under siege. Uh, in response to this, the Federals, after some hesitation about whether or not they were throwing away an opportunity in Virginia now that Lee was weak, uh, decided to take two of Meade's Corps, the 11th and the 12th, and ship them uh, to Chattanooga uh, to help to redeem that uh, situation. Uh, so this is 13,600 of Meade's troops who are pulled away from him and sent west, uh, but their loss is counterbalanced almost immediately by the return of 9,200 federal soldiers who had been detached from the Army of the Potomac uh, and sent north uh, to enforce the draft. So whereas Lee's strength has been severely reduced because of Longstreet's transfer, he's gone from 72,000 men to 55,000, uh, Meade's army, despite the loss of two entire corps, is still sitting at about 88,000 men. So the federals uh, rather significantly outnumber uh, the Confederates. But psychologically, uh, the loss of those two corps uh, is a blow for Meade, who believes that this is Lincoln deciding to put the Army of the Potomac strictly on the defensive, not that it, it matters because Meade is convinced he now doesn't have the infantry preponderance necessary uh, to assail the Army of Northern Virginia on the other side of the Rapidan. So Meade has, uh, has surrendered the initiative to Robert E. Lee, which of course is a dangerous thing to do. Lee has been wanting to attack Meade uh, since uh, August of 1863. That was the first time he was talking to Jefferson Davis uh, and saying, if Meade doesn't move, I want to strike him. Logistical difficulties and then the transfer of Longstreet uh, had made that impossible. Uh, but now that Lee knows that Meade has lost two corps, he perceived an opportunity. And so here are the positions on October 4th. The, the Federals have the, uh, the first and the sixth corps uh, along the uh, eastern reaches of the Rapidan River. Kilpatrick's cavalry is spread out along Robinson's River to the west, which is the boundary uh, between Culpeper and Madison County. Most of the rest of the Union Army is clustered here around Culpeper, uh, but Buford's cavalry division and the Federal Fifth Corps here at Stevensburg so that they could rapidly reinforce uh, the federal troops on the river. Uh, Fitz Lee's division is occupying the Confederate left. Uh, Wade Hampton's division is out here on, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Fitz Lee's on the Confederate right. Uh, and uh, Wade Hampton's division under Jeb Stewart's personal command while Hampton is still recuperating from Gettysburg wounds. The Confederate cavalry had been transformed from the division to a corps uh, in early September of 1863. Uh, Hampton's division is here on the Confederate left flank under Stewart's uh, command. Uh, A.P. Hill, three divisions are on the Confederate left. Jubal, uh, uh, R R Richard Ewell's uh, three divisions under Edward Johnson, Jubal Early, and Robert Rhodes are here on the Confederate right. Uh, and uh, Lee begins uh, on October 7th and 8th to mass his army here around Culpeper Courthouse, uh, intending to launch an offensive against me. So he leaves Fitz Lee's division along the Rapidan, supported by a brigade of infantry drawn from Johnson's division. And their job is to fool the Federals into thinking that the Confederates have not moved at all. Uh, that really doesn't work. Uh, the Federals are aware that the Confederates are moving. Uh, there are these uh, very uh, abrupt, prominent little mountains inside Culpeper County, Cedar Mountain, Pony Mountain. Uh, some of them uh, rise to a height of 1,000 feet. Uh, so the Federals have good observation points, and they look south uh, of the Rapidan, and they can tell that the Rebels are moving. 
Uh, they can tell that campfire smoke is decreasing, the tents are disappearing, but they can't tell what Lee is doing. And there are two options. Uh, one option is that he is swinging around to the west, uh, intending to either get behind the Army of the Potomac and, and cut it off from Washington a la the Second Manassas Campaign, or uh, swing off to the west and then come down on it from Madison County to attack it and force it to fight inside the treacherous terrain uh, of the Culpeper V. That, that's one option. The other option is that the Confederates are concentrating on Orange Courthouse uh, in preparation for a retreat closer to Richmond to shorten their line of supply, uh, to find a, a better line of defense now that Longstreet's Corps uh, has gone and the Federals uh, are aware of it. Either one of those options uh, you know, could be true. Uh, Meade doesn't know, evidence is, is vague, uh, so he can't be certain, uh, but he does know uh, that if Lee is retreating uh, and he manages to get away cleanly, without any federal opposition whatsoever, as he had managed to get away at Williamsport, as he had managed to get away in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, then that's going to look very bad <coughs> uh, for me, and it just might cost him his command. So, <clears throat> Meade has to figure out what to do. His gut tells him <clears throat> that Lee is probably undertaking an offensive, but since he can't be sure, he decides uh, to put his army uh, in the sort of awkward position of preparing for a defensive battle in an offensive pursuit. So um, on October 9th, Lee's army uh, marches up from behind the Rapidan through Madison County, Stuart with Hampton's division in the lead, uh, then A.P. Hill's Corps, then Ewell's Corps. Uh, and on the morning of October 10th, they're going to cross over Robinson's River uh, and drive Kilpatrick's uh, division uh, toward James City. Now, what's going on here uh, to the west? Uh, Meade, remember, uh, doesn't know if this is what the Confederates are doing or if they're retreating toward Richmond. And so in order to find out, he had sent orders uh, on uh, the uh, afternoon, uh, early evening of October 9th for John Buford's 1st Cavalry Division to ride to Germana Ford, cross the river, and then move upstream to uncover Morton's Ford, where the first Corps uh, under John Newton is located, and to which the fifth Corps under George Sykes has advanced in support. Uh, and once Buford uncovers the Ford, then the Federal Infantry is supposed to cross the river with him. They will move toward Raccoon Ford and uncover that. So John Sedgwick with the sixth Corps will cross, and then the whole lot of them will move on Orange Courthouse. Uh, the infantry uh, will take position around Rapidan Station where the railroad crosses the Rapidan River. Buford will go to the courthouse and follow the Confederate retreat. Uh, so if, if the Confederates are retreating, this is Meade uh, chasing them. But if the Confederates are advancing, he's got the third corps uh, and the second corps here uh, to the northwest of Culpeper Courthouse to uh, mount uh, at least the beginning of a defense. Now, Meade anticipated that Buford would be crossing the Rapidan at dawn on uh, October 10th, uh, but somehow Buford's orders went astray, did not reach him until 8 a.m. on the 10th. So at the time that Meade calculates that Buford is already crossing the Rapidan, Buford is just getting orders to go and cross the Rapidan and march toward Morton's Ford. And it's horrible timing for Buford. Uh, he doesn't have a single bag of grain in his whole division. His supply wagons have been sent back to a depot in Culpeper Courthouse uh, to load up on forage for his animals, uh, but he has no choice. So he rides out and it's not until 11 o'clock that he gets across the Rapidan. Fortunately, there's nothing but a handful of Confederate scouts here at Germana Ford. And then he moves upriver toward Morton's Ford, uh, but it's going to be dark uh, before he gets there. And along the way, he runs into a detachment of sharpshooters uh, from the 5th Virginia Cavalry, uh, who you know can't really do much to slow him down, uh, but they do send word back to Fitz Lee that there's Yankee cavalry uh, south of the river. Uh, so night comes down on October 10th, and this is what Meade knows. Kilpatrick has been fighting Stewart's cavalry, 
uh, yeah, long range fighting, mind you, no, no mounted action. This is skirmishing and artillery duels around James City. Now, this is exactly what Stuart wants to do. He wants to attract the attention of Kilpatrick's cavalry uh, so that it can't find out where Lee's infantry is. Stuart's also forced the Federals to relinquish uh, an observation point on Thoroughfare Mountain. Uh, so Meade has no idea where Lee's infantry is. Stuart's cavalry is here, but that doesn't necessarily mean infantry is behind it. That could be a feint uh, of some sort. Uh, but Meade is very nervous because he'd expected to hear from Buford already, and yet there's nothing, nothing at all that has come from Buford. Uh, and so Meade sweats out all of October 10th until late afternoon. And in late afternoon, he finally begins to uh, feel more and more certain that Lee's not retreating, Lee's on the offensive. Uh, and so he orders the Fifth Corps to pull back uh, immediately toward Culpeper Courthouse, and then he sends orders to the 1st and the 6th Corps to abandon any thought of uh, crossing the Rapidan, and after nightfall, they're supposed to pull back uh, to Culpeper uh, as well. So Meade's going to concentrate his army overnight at Culpeper Courthouse, and gallopers are sent after uh, Buford with orders from Cavalry Corps Commander Alfred Pleasanton telling him uh, the offensive or the pursuit uh, is, is off, uh, get across the river wherever you can and rejoin the army somewhere around Culpeper uh, Courthouse. So uh, by the time uh, that uh, Buford finds that out, it's going to be the morning uh, of, uh, of October uh, the 11th. So on the morning uh, of the 11th, uh, this is what's going on. Uh, in the wee hours of the morning, Meade has decided uh, that uh, the Confederates are absolutely on the offensive. There's no doubt about that anymore. He's not going to fight a battle in the restricting terrain of the Culpeper B. That's just too dangerous. And so he orders his army to retreat north of the Rappahannock River, where it will form a line of battle uh, to contest any Confederate offensive coming out of Culpeper County. So the Federals are, are going to begin a retreat. Now, Meade doesn't characterize this as a retreat. He characterized it as maneuvering to find good ground for battle, uh, and which you know, fair enough from his position, if, if Lee will attack him frontally across the upper Rappahannock, he'd be willing to fight. Of course, he is not going to be that foolish, and, and Meade probably knows it. Uh, but this puts uh, the Federal Cavalry in a pickle. So the, uh, the Federal 2nd Cavalry Division under David Gregg uh, is going to be moving up here to take position between Sulphur Springs and Waterloo to guard the Army's right. Uh, Buford is trying to get across the river to link up with uh, Pleasanton, who's pulling Greg uh, Kilpatrick's cavalry division back toward Culpeper to counter the Army's rear guard. So uh, the Confederates here have achieved something very important. Uh, they are fully occupying the attention of Union cavalry, which has no real idea uh, where the Confederate infantry uh, is. Uh, the Federals are not going to do that without some trouble, however, uh, because on the morning of the 11th, uh, Buford uh, is on the outskirts of Morton's Ford, waiting for the 1st Infantry Corps to show up, uh, but it's nowhere to be found. And it's seven in the morning before he gets the courier uh, from Pleasanton saying, hey, this pursuit across uh, the Rapidan has been called off. Uh, you need to get yourself over the river as quickly as you can. Well, by that point, Fitz Lee is moving uh, to deal with Buford. And so he sent uh, Lumford Lomax with the brigade and uh, some uh, cavalry, uh, some uh, horse artillery uh, to deal with Buford. And uh, Buford uh, understands that the quickest way for him to get across the river is Morton's Ford. So he takes Morton's Ford when the Confederates are in no position early in the morning to do anything about that. Uh, and uh, once he gets it, however, he finds out that the road leading down to the Ford is so bad, his artillery can't use it. He's got two batteries with it. So he's going to have to corduroy this road and cut down the steep banks on both sides of the river in order to get his guns and his horses through. And that's going to take considerable time. So until then, he has to deploy to hold the Ford, uh, and Lomax begins to push against him. Uh, then Chambliss's brigade comes up to reinforce Lomax, and coming with it are two and a half uh, regiments of North Carolina infantry. They're part of this brigade that had been left behind from Johnson's division 
uh, to bolster Fitz Lee, and they begin to press down toward the Federals, and so we get uh, the Battle uh, of Morton's Ford, and the, the Federals are, uh, are going to be able to get away, uh, and Buford, with great foresight, uh, sends uh, one of his brigades under uh, Colonel Chapman uh, north of the river and then sends it upstream to guard against any Confederate attempt uh, to move uh, east and cut Buford off by grabbing the north bank uh, of the river. Uh, so this is a tough little fight. The, the Federals are gradually forced to, uh, to retreat, uh, but they do manage to get across the river uh, without any uh, undue difficulty. Uh, at the same time, Fitz Lee has crossed the river at Raccoon Ford, uh, has been moving upstream, trying to do exactly what Buford was afraid he would do, and that's cut him off. Uh, but Chapman's brigade meets him uh, near the Stringfellow Farm. There's a nasty little fight, uh, which blunts Fitz Lee's move just long enough to allow uh, Buford's other, uh, other brigade under uh, Devon uh, to get across the river and then begin to retreat in the direction of uh, Culpeper Courthouse, which is the same direction that Chapman has been told uh, to go to. Uh, so while this fight uh, at Morton's Ford has been uh, taking place, uh, the other side of the uh, map, uh, Stewart uh, has ridden uh, into Culpeper Courthouse in front of Lee's infantry, uh, and he's found Kilpatrick's division aligned on the ridge uh, to the north of the town and understanding that he's not going to push them away because they badly outnumber him, uh, he tries to outflank uh, Kilpatrick and cut him off. Uh, Kilpatrick sees what's going on and he begins to withdraw uh, toward uh, Fleetwood Heights, just a couple of miles uh, from the Rappahannock. At the same time that this is happening, however, Buford, who's retreated over Morton's Ford, re- uh, unites his division uh, and is retreating in the same direction with Fitz Lee following him. And you get this uh, very dramatic moment on the afternoon of October 11th when four full cavalry divisions uh, are within sight of each other in this generally open terrain uh, north of Culpeper uh, Courthouse and uh, on the old battlefield of Brandy Station. Uh, and they're all galloping forward just as fast as they could go uh, the mounted regiments, the horse artillery, uh, the flags flapping in the breeze. It was, according to every soldier who wrote about it, one of the most breathtaking sights uh, of the entire war. Uh, unfortunately for the Confederates, Buford has the inside track, and he's going to get up here to Fleetwood Heights, uh, and Fitz Lee's not going to be able to stop him. But Fitz Lee uh, looks over here and he sees what Stuart is trying to do. Uh, initially, he mistakes Stuart uh, to be part of Kilpatrick's force and he lobs some artillery shells over here, which discombobulates Stuart a little bit. But Stuart says, hey, the only way to make sure that Fitz knows I'm friends is to attack uh, Kilpatrick's column. And if I can slow him up here around Brandy Station uh, or south of Brandy Station, uh, Fitz Lee can cut him off. Uh, and keep him from linking up with uh, Buford. Uh, and so you have this really uh, dramatic cavalry action uh, uh, around Brandy Station, uh, between Brandy Station and Culpeper. Uh, this is classic cavalry combat. Uh, everybody's mounted. A lot of this fighting is done uh, with the saber uh, and, and pistol. Uh, and uh, the Confederates manage to slow Kilpatrick enough uh, for Fitz Lee to get a couple of regiments uh, in between Buford and Kilpatrick. And at that point, George Custer, who's one of Kilpatrick's brigade commanders, rides up uh, to Pleasanton and he says, hey, let me cut our way out. Uh, and he gets permission. And so he makes this very dramatic attack uh, to push the 5th and 6th Virginia Cavalry out of his way and allow Kilpatrick to link up with Buford on Fleetwood Heights. The Confederate uh, cavalry concentrates and there's a big battle to and fro, uh, but ultimately it's a stalemate. The Union cavalry is able to retreat safely across the Rappahannock. And at that juncture, uh, Meade has all of his troops north uh, of the Rappahannock uh, River, uh, and uh, Lee has got his infantry moving uh, into Culpeper Courthouse, uh, but Meade doesn't know 
where Lee's infantry is. He, he's lost complete track of it. His cavalry has been in a fight for survival. So um, what Meade does know is that some of the last federal units to retreat over the Rappahannock had seen the infantry that had gone in support of Pitts Lee and they noted Confederate soldiers wearing knapsacks. Well, that means infantry. Uh, and so on the morning of October 12th, Meade's army is arrayed for battle here along the banks of the Upper Rappahannock, uh, but they don't know where the Confederates are. And so once it gets to the question comes out, is Lee trying to outflank us again? Or was he looking for a battle in Culpeper and, and we denied that battle to him uh, and by getting north of the Rappahannock and so he's still here in Culpeper willing to fight or was all of this an elaborate feint to cover retreat toward Richmond? And there's no answer. Uh, and if the Confederates were in fact attempting uh, to cross uh, the upper Rappahannock beyond Meade's infantry, uh, then they would run into Gregg's Cavalry Division, which has been deployed here around Waterloo and Sulphur Springs uh, in order uh, to keep an eye out against any such threat. Uh, and unfortunately uh, for Meade, this is, this is exactly what Lee is doing. Uh, but by noon, none of Gregg's men uh, have made contact with the Confederates and a reconnaissance by the 1st Main Cavalry uh, leaves too early to run into the rebels. It actually crosses their path uh, on its way to Sperryville before it turns around, uh, but it doesn't see the rebels at all. And so noon comes and Meade doesn't know where the Confederate infantry is. And now he's having second thoughts. This retreat north of the Rappahannock without fighting uh, is probably going to look very bad in Washington. And it does. Uh, when Lee had gone over to the offensive, Halleck and Lincoln perceived that he's presented a great opportunity uh, to meet. He's come out from his fortifications and now you can fight him out in the open. They're rather appalled that the Army of the Potomac had withdrawn out of the Culpeper V rather than fight there. They're not really interested in the tactical conundrums of the Culpeper V. What they see is a retreat uh, that shouldn't happen. Uh, and so Meade now begins to think, well, if Lee's himself retreating and I pulled back, this is going to look very bad. If me, if Lee wants to fight in Culpeper County, uh, then maybe I should fight him there. So at noon, he decides to recross the river with half of his army uh, and to uh, see if Lee's waiting to fight around Culpeper uh, Courthouse. So he sends Buford's division along with the 6th Corps and the 5th Corps, backed up by the 2nd Corps, all under the command of John Sedgwick. Uh, to find out if the rebels are in the Culpeper Beat willing to fight. Now, as they move down the railroad, they run into nothing but a Confederate cavalry brigade under Brigadier General Pierce Young, uh, 600 guys who put up quite, you know, the, the show of defiance uh, and pulling out every trick in the book to make it look like they're bigger than they are. Uh, but Buford figures this out very quickly, and he sends word back to uh, Meade uh, that, hey, look, the, the Army of Northern Virginia is not around a Culpeper courthouse, but where is it? The Federals still don't know. Uh, so as dusk falls, all of these troops, some 30,000 men who've gone with Cedric, uh, make camp uh, on the south bank of the upper Rappahannock, completely ignorant uh, that while they were making this thrust, Lee's infantry has crossed the river beyond their flank. So the Confederates uh, under Ewell's Corps have advanced on the town of Jeffersonton. Uh, they have run into a couple of uh, federal cavalry regiments, which they route and drive back uh, toward uh, Sulphur Springs, where they route the rest of a federal cavalry brigade. Uh, the federal cavalry, which had been sent out here under Greg, had strict orders not to fight. It was there only to gain information. Uh, but the courier who sent back to spread the alarm <clears throat> that we've run into Confederate infantry in Jeffersonton in Sulphur Springs, he gets wounded and captured. <clears throat> and so uh, the, the word from Greg doesn't reach Meade until nine o'clock on the night of October 12th. So uh, Meade and his, his headquarters staff are sitting around the campfire pondering where Lee's gone. He's not in Culpeper. They've heard nothing from Greg. So he probably uh, has been feigning and is in fact retreating. And then all of a sudden, Meade finds out 
that the Army of Northern Virginia has bolted the upper Rappahannock and is now uh, on the same side of the river as half of his army with a clear route into the federal rear. And in fact, Stewart's got to take two of his regiments and occupy Warrenton uh, that, that evening. Uh, Meade now knows where the Confederate infantry is, however, and he reacts uh, decisively. And so as the nightfall uh, occurs on October 12th, here are the Federals, you see half of the army is here with Cedric on this side of the river, the other half is over here, but now Meade knows that Lee is beyond his flank uh, and there's a real chance that the Confederates are going to get between the Army of the Potomac and Washington. So at that point, Meade orders a full-scale withdrawal or retreat, if you prefer, uh, up the line of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. And this, is, uh, this retreat is hampered by the fact uh, that he's got a 1,200 wagon supply train, which is the Army's general reserve, that's uh, very slow. And, and so this is going to be a burden uh, during the retreat. Uh, it's going to take up a lot of road space. So Meade decides to send his second and third corps, along with Kilpatrick and Gray's cavalry divisions, uh, on an alternate route uh, to the west of the rest of the Army, which is going to pull up uh, the ONA, they're going to move through the little hamlet of Auburn uh, and then go north to unclog uh, the roads. Now, of course, as the Federals are going to be retreating all through the, the night of the 13th and on into dawn uh, of, of the, the next day, uh, the Confederates are also concentrating around Warrington. But unfortunately for Lee, Northern Virginia has been made a wasteland by two years of war. So his troops can't live off the land the way that they had been able to do in 1862. Uh, and so he has to pause at Warrington to let his supply train catch up with them so he can provision the army for the next leap. So the advantage that he'd won over Meade uh, at Sulphur Springs and Jeffersonton by getting over the river without me knowing it evaporates uh, on, on uh, the 13th. Stuart However, conducts a reconnaissance uh, down toward the ONA to find out where the Federals are. And unfortunately for Stuart, uh, he now rides across the path of the approaching Federal Second and Third Corps, the Third Corps in the lead. And so uh, as the Federals are retreating over the Rappahannock, and, and here they are retreating over the railroad bridge and the forge near uh, Rappahannock Station, uh, and once they're all across, they burn the bridge up behind them so the Confederates uh, cannot use it. Uh, the little village of Auburn now becomes the center point of affairs. It's a tiny little hamlet with a, with a significant hill uh, behind it, but five roads intersect here, going to Warrenton, going north uh, toward Buckland uh, Mills and Greenwich, uh, going south toward the Rappahannock, and of course going east toward uh, the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Uh, and so you have two federal corps and two cavalry divisions coming up here. Stewart has uh, got three brigades at Auburn, uh, and he rides up to the top of this hill behind the little village. He looks south, and he sees a lot of federal movement. But at the moment he sees these Union troops, it looks like they're going to make a right turn and go down to the railroad. So he leaves Lomax's brigade, uh, to Garter's rear, he takes Funston and Gordon's brigade and a battery of horse artillery, and he rides down to St. Stephen's Church to see what he can find out. And when he gets there uh, and he looks down toward the railroad, he sees the bulk of the Army of the Potomac and that 1,200 wagon supply train parked alongside the road, uh, uh, consuming a 300-acre field. Uh, one Union soldier said there were so many white-topped wagons in that one plane that it looked like the entire surface uh, was covered in snow. Uh, the rest of the Confederate Army is concentrated at Warrenton. Fitz Lee's division is coming up, uh, and it's going to then uh, move toward Auburn uh, to support uh, Stuart with Hampton's uh, division. Uh, but now you can see uh, that were set up for a clash. Uh, Major General William French's Third Corps is coming up on Auburn, where, where Lomax is all by himself. And when the Third Corps uh, comes up, uh, Lomax, who is reinforced by Fitz Lee, just as the fighting starts, uh, realizes that he can't stand in front of all this federal infantry. And so the Confederate cavalry is forced to back off to the west. 
Uh, Stewart is here at St. Stephen Church looking at all these Federals, and he perceives an opportunity. So he sends a courier back to tell Lee, I found the Union infantry. If you can come up very quickly, we can hit them uh, and stop their retreat. But when the courier gets back to Auburn, uh, just as night is falling, he finds not Lomax and Fitz Lee, but an entire Federal Infantry Corps and Kilpatrick's division shoving their way across broad, or rather, a Cedar Run uh, right here. Uh, and so uh, he sends word back to Stuart, you're cut off. And Stuart turns around and he races back to Auburn. And when he gets there, the Federals are still using the Ford and the little bridge at the, the village. And so Stuart has to hide his infantry uh, in some woods because he's now caught between two wings of the Union Army. It's going to be a very long uh, and worrisome night uh, for Stuart and his two brigades and their, their artillery. But Stuart, ever aggressive, sends a courier through the lines to Lee, telling him where he's at and suggesting that if Confederate infantry could strike Auburn from the west in the morning, he could attack from the east and whatever Federals are between them might be destroyed. That message doesn't get to Lee until one in the morning. He's been worried about Stuart. Where is he? He has heard from him for a long time. This is very unusual. Now he knows, but this is, this is a big problem for Lee because if he really wants to cut off the Army of the Potomac, he needs to send his troops uh, from Warrington, marching off to the Northeast, trying to get around in front of the Federals and cut them off. Uh, if he takes the army to Auburn, uh, then he's not going to be able to do that. But he can't leave Stuart out there on his own traps. So he orders Ewell uh, to march at 4 a.m. to Stuart's relief. A.P. Hill, meanwhile, will start that big flank march, uh, aiming to cut the Federals off and stop their uh, retreat. So this is going to produce uh, a, a rather fascinating uh, engagement on the morning of October 14th around Auburn. So that morning, uh, Ewell and Hill are concentrated around Warrington. Uh, Fitz Lee is just to the west of Auburn. Stewart is cut off. Uh, the Federal Third Corps has completed its march and gone into camp at Greenwich. Uh, Kilpatrick has moved a little further north to camp at uh, Buckland Mills. The rest of the Union Army is here along the railroad. But uh, Governor Warren, in command of the Second Corps and uh, David Gray's cavalry, have gone into bivouac uh, just a, a, a mile or so south uh, of Auburn. And so this is what things are doing on the morning of October 14th. Uh, so at dawn, the armies go into motion. Uh, Meade is continuing his uh, retreat, uh, intending to get his army to Centerville and the fortifications there and the rest of it behind Broad Run. Uh, from Greenwich, the Third Corps is going to swing down toward Bristow Station uh, and cross the river there. Kilpatrick's going to go up to Sudley Springs. But Gregg and Warren now have new orders. Instead of following uh, the Third Corps to Greenwich, they're supposed to turn right at Auburn and rejoin the Army on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which means that they're going to move straight toward uh, Stewart's hiding spot. A.P. Hill is beginning his march to try and get in front of the Federals. Ewell is moving toward Stewart's relief. Uh, and so uh, just as a foggy sunrise uh, begins on the morning of the 14th, uh, the Confederate uh, infantry uh, advancing toward the Carolina Road, which runs up into Auburn, uh, stumble into Gregg's outpost. There's a, an outburst of firing. Uh, Stuart, who's here hiding, hears it and believes, okay, my couriers have gotten to Lee uh, and he's making this attack. And so now I'm, my job is to strike from the east. Uh, Stuart wills out his artillery and he opens fire on John Codwell's brigade, which was the first to cross a uh, Cedar Run and had orders to go up on this hill behind Auburn, the same hill that Stuart had used as an observation point the day before, uh, and to uh, to have breakfast with his army here uh, to hold this high ground while the rest of the Second Corps and Gregg's uh, cavalry crosses the river and turns east toward Auburn. And there's a federal battery that goes up here to support him, the guns facing west in the direction that the Confederates are supposed to be. But when the rebel artillery suddenly opens fire from the east, it's a giant surprise to everybody. Uh, and uh, the Federals uh, are 
are hurt. Uh, the Confederate artillery kills or wounds about 25, 30 men, uh, even as they're making their morning coffee. Uh, the Federal's uh, infantry retreats to the reverse side of the hill uh, and, and gets under cover. The Federal artillery turns around, begins to fire towards Stewart. Uh, and this is where uh, this otherwise unnamed hill now gets a name. For the Federals forevermore, this would be Coffee Hill, Coffee Hill. Uh, so uh, Stewart's artillery uh, punches uh, Caldwell's division in the nose, uh, but almost as soon as the Confederate artillery opens fire, all of the musketry to the West stops because Ewell had not expected to run into uh, resistance when he did. He doesn't know the terrain. It's very foggy. So he's got to pause and try and figure out what's going on. Uh, and then he's going to have to deploy his whole corps. Uh, and that means that Stewart uh, has revealed his position. Uh, he's exposed now, and what's worse is that the federal infantry, instead of doing what French had done the night before, and that's march to the west, has turned to the east, and Stuart knows now he's got no choice, he's got to make a run for it, uh, but he's got to delay the federal advance long enough to get his wagons, his artillery, and his cavalry out on the road, so uh, Thomas Ruffin in the 1st North Carolina Cavalry is ordered to make uh, more or less a suicide charge against the federal infantry to slow them down, to knock them on their heels long enough for the rest of Stuart's men to get away. Uh, this they do very gallantly. Ruffin is mortally wounded in the fight, uh, and, and uh, the Confederates uh, take a lot of losses, but they manage uh, to, to stop Hayes' division in its tracks long enough for Stuart to uh, get away. So Stuart's making a run for it now, and he's going to successfully uh, escape uh, without any trouble. Now, Warren's afraid that he's about to be surrounded and cut off, so he's deploying infantry along with Gray's cavalry to make a stand to protect the road so that he can get to Auburn. Uh, Yule's coming up, and he's beginning to deploy his forces, but once the fog burns away, looks at all this high ground, he says, man, I don't want to make a frontal attack into that. Uh, so he begins to deploy his corps, uh, sending Rhodes off to the south, bringing Johnson in to the center, sending early across Cedar Run with orders to outflank uh, Coffee Hill. Uh, and all this time, of course, there's skirmishing going on, but the federal infantry and their supply trains are getting to Auburn and heading off uh, to the east. And by the time uh, that Ewell's ready to launch a full-on assault, the Federals have basically escaped the track. The, the rear brigade uh, under Colonel Brooke uh, is beat up a little bit. Uh, it loses some prisoners, uh, but basically the Second Corps manages to get away, gets to the ONA, and turns north to follow the rest of the Army of the Potomac, and that Corps and Gregg's Cavalry are now the rear guard of the Union Army. And having uh, rescued uh, Stuart obliquely, uh, and having chased the Second Corps away, Ewell now begins to move by side roads in the same direction uh, that A.P. Hill uh, is traveling. And so we uh, Ewell is coming up here. Here's A.P. Hill. Uh, Fitz Lee is uh, taking a, a, a gander at what Kilpatrick is doing and making sure he'll cause no trouble. Stuart uh, is supposed to, uh, with the uh, brigades that are with him, be moving uh, along uh, Ewell's right flank or his western flank uh, to let him know what the Federals are doing here. But Stuart hasn't slept the whole night before. His men are exhausted. And so he makes an uncharacteristic mistake. He follows a battalion of sharpshooters that Ewell has sent to, to poke at the Union rear guard. Stuart somehow thinks that this is Ewell's main thrust. And so instead of uh, moving along with Ewell and guarding his flank, Stuart follows the Federals down to the Origin Alexandria Railroad and will be poking at Gregg's rear guard, which means there's no Confederate cavalry out in front uh, of Lee's infantry as it begins to bear down on the railroad near Bristow Station. Uh, and so at 2 p.m. on October 14th, A.P. Hill uh, is riding just a little bit ahead of his corps, uh, whose lead division belongs to Harry Hepp, and he gets to uh, a ridge overlooking Bristow Station. There's the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which at this point uh, runs on top of a very steep railroad embankment as it comes toward a uh, broad run. And as Hill gets up here, he sees a, he sees a mass of Union stragglers 
uh, on this plane, uh, and he sees the Federal Fifth Corps, uh, which belongs to George Sykes, which has been waiting uh, for uh, the arrival of Warren. Uh, as Meade retreated towards Centerville, uh, he tried to keep his infantry corps within supporting distance of each other. So Sykes was supposed to stay in supporting distance of the second corps, uh, and the third corps under French was supposed to stay in supporting distance of Sykes. But Sykes is very nervous today, uh, and he's really afraid that the Confederates are going to get between him and the Third Corps, and if that happens, it would be a disaster. Uh, so he's been pleading with, with Warren, where are you when you're going to get here? Uh, and so he's been very anxious to get back on the road. And when he sees an advanced patrol of the Second Corps show up at Bristow, really just an advanced scouting party, he takes that as the arrival of the entire Second Corps, and he begins to move towards Centerville. Uh, and this, this is going to create a great deal of bitterness with the Second Corps. Uh, one of his officers is going to uh, quip that Sykes was told that the Second Corps was coming, and indeed it was, and so was Christmas. Uh, Sykes is leaving too early. Uh, but this turns out to be fortuitous for the Federals because Hill, seeing Sykes getting onto the road, believes that this is the Union rear guard. He knows nothing about what's happened at Auburn early in the morning, uh, he's been following along the path of the Third Corps' retreat, picking up stragglers, discarded weapons, the campfires of the Federals are still warm. So he thinks he's on the hot pursuit of the Federal Rear Guard, and that is Sykes. And he doesn't take time to look around and to see what might be out here around Bristow. And so he's going to miss the arrival of Webb's Brigade, a Webb's division uh, of the Second Corps. Uh, so Hill, perceiving that, you know, there's no time to be lost, hurries forward a battalion of artillery, uh, has Heth deploy his division, which has two big North Carolina regiments, Kirkland's and Cook. These had not been at Gettysburg, so they were oversized. Uh, Pogue's artillery opens fire on all these federal stragglers, panics them, they begin to flee. Uh, this does nothing to halt Sykes, who now is really eager uh, to speed things up. And uh, fortunately, uh, one of his uh, division commanders, McCandless, says, hey, I can't run away. I, I need to stay here and see what's going on. But most of the rest of the Fifth Corps is, is bugging out. Uh, and as Hef is concentrating his gaze here, uh, the Second Corps is showing up. Uh, and Webb, who believes that his job is to get across the railroad, uh, dashes up here toward Broad Run, uh, briefly deploys artillery and his infantry, uh, begins to send out skirmishers toward the Confederates, and they're sending out their own skirmishers. Uh, and so suddenly this space between the two lines uh, is, is becoming a very sensitive area uh, for uh, both armies. Uh, Webb initially tries to cross Broad Run, but Governor Warren, uh, comes up uh, just as he's doing that. He was the Army's chief engineer before taking command of the Second Corps, so he knows this area very well, and he sees an opportunity here uh, with, this, uh, with this railroad embankment. So he tells Webb to come back and to put his men behind that railroad embankment, uh, and he orders artillery up onto the high ground behind the embankment and orders Alexander Hayes' division, which is coming up, to hurry into line uh, next to Webb. Uh, the federal skirmishers have been firing into the flank of the Confederates who have had orders from Hill to advance uh, after the Fifth Corps, and the uh, fire from these federal skirmishers becomes so annoying uh, that Brigadier General uh, Cook, uh, in command of the right flank brigade, decides, I've got to deal with this, and he wheels toward the skirmishers, which requires Kirkland uh, to wheel toward them as well. The federal skirmishers retreat toward the railroad. The Confederates are moving toward the railroad. Hayes Division has just shown up. It's moving toward the railroad. Uh, the firing is beginning, but the Confederates really can't see the Federals. Uh, they're firing at these retreating skirmishers and shooting at the federal batteries that they see going into uh, position uh, beyond the railroad embankment. And a bunch of those bullets are plopping down around Hayes uh, advancing division. Uh, and uh, some of Hazeman said that that fire was worse than anything that they had gone through toward Gettysburg. But just in the nick of time, uh, the Federals managed to get behind that railroad embankment, 
uh, as Cook and Kirkland advance on it. Now, this is a hesitant advance. This is not some grand sweeping charge like happened on July 3rd at Gettysburg. This was not an advance that was ordered by Heth. It's not an advance that was ordered by Hill. Uh, what Heth had been told to do by Hill was to cross Broad Run and follow uh, the Fifth Corps. Uh, but now the federal fire here has forced these, uh, these two brigades to wheel. Uh, the Confederates hurry some artillery up onto the high ground where the federal skirmishers had been uh, originally posted to support the attack. Uh, and uh, the Confederate infantry still doesn't know their Yankee counterparts are behind that railroad embankment. Cook goes down uh, with a shattered leg very early on in the action. Kirkland's gonna get wounded too. Uh, and these two brigades pause for a few moments, uh, trying to figure out what to do and then decide, well, the only logical thing to do is to either retreat or attack and they decide to attack. Uh, so they try to uh, reach the railroad embankment uh, and uh, some of them get further than others, uh, but basically they're met by a wall of federal fire uh, from the infantry behind this impromptu breastwork and the federal artillery. Uh, and although some of the Confederates managed to break through where a road pierces the embankment, some of them get around uh, Webb's flank uh, it's not in enough strength to do anything, uh, and the attack is beaten back with very heavy losses, and the Confederates are forced to uh, retreat. Uh, and so the rebels uh, pull back uh, and try to regroup. Uh, Anderson's division has come up on the field, and A.P. Hill is trying to deploy it, uh, and, uh, and uh, Ewell's uh, troops are uh, reaching the field as well. Uh, Caldwell's division, which was the uh, last of uh, Warren's divisions and had been acting as the rear guard, uh, is showing up to strengthen the federal position. Uh, and at the same time, you have this very dramatic moment uh, where the Union cavalry with all those wagon trains is having to divert around the fighting and swing off to the east, uh, lest they get caught up by uh, this battle that suddenly broke up, uh, broken out. Uh, around Bristow uh, Station. Uh, so the Confederates are consolidating in front of the Second Corps, which is now isolated. The Fifth Corps has marched off and left it uh, to fend for itself. Uh, Gregg's Cavalry Division has shown up to reinforce Warren, uh, but this is the smallest corps in the Army of the Potomac. And uh, it has two advantages right now. One, uh, behind that railroad embankment, the Confederates still aren't certain of its position. Uh, and two, it's, it's October and night comes fairly early. And so uh, Ewell is trying to deploy his divisions uh, to attack uh, the flank of the Federals, uh, but Gordon's brigade uh, sees those Federal wagons and chases after them, which completely disrupts uh, the plan of Jubal Early. He can't, without Gordon, his biggest division, he can't launch that attack and night falls before Lee uh, can really uh, get, come to grips again uh, with Warren. And overnight, uh, Warren manages to slip away in the rain, and uh, at dawn, he crosses Bull Run and uh, rejoins the Army of the Potomac. Uh, the Confederate cavalry goes to Bull Run. It skirmishes with the Federals there to kind of keep them busy. But in fact, Lee has decided uh, that he's really done all that he can do. Me, uh, has escaped by the narrowest margin. Uh, Lee has not been able to hurt him. Uh, he could outflank him again with another swing around the federal right, but all that would do would be to chase the Yankees into the defenses of Washington where Lee can't get at them. Uh, Lee would like to linger close to the Potomac and keep the Federals pinned against their namesake river uh, during the winter, but he knows that he can't live off the land which has of course been laid waste. And he knows that Richmond can't keep him supplied that far north. So he has no real alternative, but to retreat back into Culpeper uh, County. And so he gives that order. And as his infantry pulls back, it is also instructed to utterly destroy the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Uh, because if Meade is going to pursue, he has to have that railroad as a supply line. The Federals have to build that railroad as they follow, they're not going to be able to follow very quickly. And if Lee was lucky, uh, winter might show up before the Federals could finish, uh, finish the job. Uh, the uh, Federals 
Uh, don't begin a pursuit until October 18th. They're slowed down by a day of rain that floods will run. Uh, and uh, since Meade is being very careful and he's also lost sight of the Confederate infantry again, uh, he keeps Gregg and Buford's divisions to guard the Army's rear. And so only Kilpatrick's division is able uh, to pursue the Confederates. And as it moves uh, down the Warrenton Turnpike, it runs into Hampton's division uh, around Buckland Mills, and there's something of a standoff. Now, over to the east, Fitz Lee's division is pulling back uh, um, down the railroad uh, from Bristow Station, being pursued by Wesley Merritt's Reserve Cavalry Brigade. <clears throat> and uh, Stewart and Fitz Lee are in communication by a signal flag, uh, and uh, Stewart has ordered Fitz Lee to come over and reinforce him, and Fitz Lee uh, suggests uh, uh, an opportunity is at hand to destroy Kilpatrick's division. And so he tells Stewart, if you will retreat toward Warrington or if foe retreats toward Warrington and pull Kilpatrick after you, I'll cut over from Bristow Station and I'll get behind the Federals and I'll open up on them with my guns and then you could turn around and we'll trap Kilpatrick between us and we will destroy him. Uh, this, uh, this comes very, very close to working, and it only doesn't work uh, because Custer, who had been leading Kilpatrick's uh, flight at Buckland the, early in the morning, uh, asked for permission to, uh, to stay at Buckland and feed his troops uh, before he follows Davies' brigade <coughs> after Stewart, and uh, Kilpatrick gave permission. So when Fitz Lee comes up, instead of finding empty space, uh, he finds Custer, uh, and a fight breaks out. And when that fight breaks out, Stuart turns around to attack Davies, who suddenly heard what's going on and has turned around, leaving only the second New York as a rear guard. Uh, and the result is the Battle of Buckland Mills. And eventually the Confederates get a force in between uh, Davies and Custer. Uh, Custer is forced to retreat back up the turnpike of Fitz Lee in pursuit. Davies has to make a wild cross-country uh, run uh, to get over a uh, uh, broad run here, and his, his brigade is essentially routed in trying to get over broad run, uh, and for three miles, the Confederates give chase, running the Federals all the way back to Gainesville and Haymarket, uh, where the Yankees finally gain security uh, in the arms of their infantry. There's some skirmishing that night, uh, but the Confederates disengage and retired to Buckland, and they promptly uh, named the entire affair the Buckland Races. And so uh, this takes a little bit of the sting out of the infantry's debacle uh, at Bristow Station, gives something of an upbeat flavor to the end of the campaign. Uh, but overall, the campaign has been a big disappointment for both Lee and Meade. Uh, Meade, who admits that Lee has outgeneraled him, uh, Lee is disappointed that he was not able to cut off and destroy some portion of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and so the Confederates are, are pulling back. Uh, they're all on the day that the uh, Battle of Buckland Mills is fought, Lee's infantry crosses the upper Rappahannock into Culpeper. Uh, but uh, Kilpatrick, trying to explain what had happened to it at Buckland, uh, basically tells a lie. He tells a Meade. Uh, that Stuart's cavalry had been supported by infantry. It was only because he was attacked by infantry that he had been run off the battlefield. And uh, Meade takes that at face value and says, I finally know where Lee's infantry is. It's somewhere between Buckland and Warrenton. And so on the night of the uh, 19th, he concentrates the entire Army of the Potomac at Gainesville with the intention of marching toward Buckland and having the big battle that he's been looking for ever since Gettysburg um, on the morning of the 20th, but when the Federals advance, uh, not even Stewart's there. He's already left. The Federal blow falls onto thin air, and once more, uh, Meade has to wire uh, General Halleck to tell him that the Army of Northern Virginia has given him the slip. So it happened at Williamsport, and it happened at Manassas Gap, and now it has happened at, at Buckland. So a very dissatisfying in. Uh, to the campaign for the Federals. They now pivot and come back to the railroad to find that Lee's infantry has utterly and completely destroyed. This is an actual picture taken of that destruction 
in October of 1863. So the Confederates have pulled up all the ties. They've set them on fire, laid the rails on top of them so that they warped into uselessness. They've destroyed every bridge, every culvert. They've even cut down the telegraph poles uh, running alongside the railroad. They burned all the stations. And it's going to take uh, the Federals uh, about three weeks to rebuild that railroad. And until that railroad is rebuilt, uh, there is no way for the Army of the Potomac to get at the Army of Northern uh, Virginia. Uh, but once that railroad is rebuilt, uh, Meade is going to resume the offensive, uh, which is going to produce the remarkable fighting on November 7, 1863 at Kelly's Ford uh, and Rappahannock Station, uh, which is the subject uh, of my uh, third book. Uh, and so at the end of October, uh, this is where you are. The Federals here around Warrenton uh, as they're rebuilding the railroad, the Confederates in Culpeper. In other words, this is exactly where the armies were at the end of July of 1863. Uh, so we here several months later, uh, and we're back to the stalemate, the status quo that had existed at the end of the Gettysburg campaign. And what did it cost uh, to get back to that stalemated point? Uh, 4,118 casualties all told between the two sides, the Federals uh, losing uh, almost 2,300 men, the Confederates nearly 2,000. Uh, the Federals lost much more heavily in, in missing, uh, but the Confederates lost much more heavily in killed and wounded, uh, and almost all of those casualties were suffered uh, at the Battle of Bristow Station. Uh, and so, although these are relatively minor fights, when you talk about uh, comparing them to a Gettysburg or Fredericksburg or a Chancellorsville, uh, for the men killed, wounded, or captured in these battles and for their families at home, uh, these were the most important fights uh, of the entire war. That is wonderful, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions. Uh, I hope you can hang around just for another minute and we will uh, ask them. So the first question um, asked early on, uh, this was a question about the cavalry. What types of weapons were being used midway through the war? Uh, the person specifically asked that, uh, they asked about sabers and whether uh, the Confederate Army was still using sabers or whether they had preferred to, to use pistols and, and, and other, uh, you know. No, both sides are still carrying their sabers. And in all this fighting around Brandy Station on October 11th, uh, almost all of that was saber uh, combat wow. until you got to Fleetwood Heights. Uh, and then, you know, they're in close quarters combat, you know, uh, people are using pistols. But then it's, it's the carbines. Uh, and, and the rifles, uh, the first Maryland cavalry on the Confederate side was armed with infantry rifles, uh, which were longer range than the carbines. And so they were kind of a trump card for the Confederates. They would dismount those uh, guys and take the Federals under long range fire to make it easier for the mounted regiments to get each other. But yeah, this is classic cavalry combat right. uh, on October uh, the 11th, a lot of, a lot of saber uh, fighting. Right. That's amazing. Actually, in our collection, we have a cavalry saber that has lots of little nicks in it. And we, we like to think that was from some of that close combat cavalry fighting. Um, another person asked when you were discussing Buckland Mills, uh, where was the Florida Brigade, the Confederate Florida Brigade? I assume they're referencing the brigade that had fought at Gettysburg um, in Longstreet. Yeah. And so they're they're there uh, and they are um, they are not at Bristow Station. Uh, but they get the, the, the great honor of burying the dead and collecting the wounded. And there's this great letter uh, from a soldier in the Florida Brigade to his, uh, huh. his uh, girlfriend back home uh, talking about what that was like. And it was so horrible that I couldn't even begin to try and describe it to you. And then he goes on to try and describe it to her. <laughs> it talks about there were very few intact bodies uh, left uh, from Cook and Kirkland's brigade. The artillery fire had been so vicious. And so he's like, there's a body without a head. Uh, there's a head without a body. Over here, all there is a hand or a finger uh, and that sort of thing. So they weren't in any of the combat, uh, but they got to wade through the, the worst aftermath of the combat. Wow. Those types of letters, the, it's amazing how desensitized some of these soldiers had become. We have a couple locally that were sent home during this period and, you know, informing family members that brothers had been killed and just the, the vivid descriptions of uh, the, the aftermath of some of these battles. Uh, it's just really stunning. Um, and then another the last, thing that, yeah, sure. An another thing that, that happens here, of course, is that after, uh, on the day after a Bristow station, Lee shows up 
he's watching the Florida Brigade collect the bodies and stuff, and Hill rides over to him uh, and, and, and takes responsibility for what happens. And there's a there's a, a, a myth that, you know, he starts to explain and Lee says, uh, you know, basically, never mind, bury these poor men general and, and we'll say nothing about it. Well, in reality, there are two eyewitnesses. One of them writes a letter and the other puts in their diary that day that, in fact, Lee dressed Hill down and says, yes, you did make a terrible mistake. You, you, your line of battle was too thin. Your reserves were too far behind. And this scathing rebuke from Lee uh, really embarrassed Hill. And somebody said he, it looked like he wanted to shrink down into his huge cavalry boots uh, and disappear. And it was kind of after seeing, uh, you know, Hill's reaction that Lee says, well, never mind, bury your men, we'll say nothing uh, more about it. And, and so that's, that's one myth from Bristow Station uh, that the evidence points to a very different reality. Right. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, and then, so the, the last comment that I could pick up on, and if there are others, please let us know. And uh, so I'll read the last one. So this was a question about pontoons. How effective were uh, pontoon boats? <laughs> well, they were incredibly effective. Uh, and of course, the Federals have many more of them than uh, the Confederates do. And so when they retreat over the upper Rappahannock, they've employed pontoons at Kelly's Ford. They've employed two sets of them uh, around Rappahannock Station. Uh, and so one of the reasons the federal retreat was as efficient as, as it was, and federal soldiers commented on it, says this retreat's going off better than any of them that McClellan ever did. Means much better at this uh, than old George. Uh, and, but on the other side of it, uh, there was a substantial pontoon train with all those supply wagons, and they were even more ponderous than the wagons. And Robert had the job during the retreat of guarding all of that, and he said it would have taxed the patience of Job. Uh, because these things move so slowly. And toward the end, there was a real threat that the Confederate cavalry was going to catch up with all of that and capture it. And there were several instances while they were stalled at Fords or there was a, a wagon or a pontoon stuck and blocking the road that the Federals prepared to burn all of their pontoons and that mass wagon train rather than let it fall into Confederate uh, hands. Uh, personally for them, they, they, they got the obstruction out of the way and kept moving so it didn't happen but it was nip and tuck for a while right right that's incredible um and i would point out too a lot of people are commenting they love the presentation they love your maps which i i really love i said that last time i think but uh everybody loves in courtesy map. of my wife who's, oh, yes, who's a graphic good. designer and she <laughs> she does all the maps for me yeah. yes that is wonderful um and and it really helps i think all of us can attest to having read civil war books that don't have maps and you're trying to you know figure out what's happening without really being able to, to see it and understand it as well. So uh, anyway, well, I think that's all the questions I could see, but I'm sure uh, if there are any other questions, please reach out to us and I'll, I'll definitely pass those along uh, to Jeffrey even after the program. Uh, and but I'll, I'll you, look at the uh, Facebook comments and yeah. ask them there, I'll, I'll answer there. There are quite a few. I tried to get all of them, but sometimes they go by so fast you can't even... Uh, keep up with it. So anyway, thank you so much to everybody who watched tonight. And, and again, thank you so much, Jeffrey, for all of your time and putting together a whole series of programs based on your careful research into uh, the aftermath of Gettysburg and this really important phase of the Civil War that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. So if you liked the presentation, I hope you'll donate. And also, I hope you'll look at the uh, link we posted uh, in the comments and in this post to, uh, to check out getting a copy of Jeffrey's book. Um, so thanks, Jeffrey, and thank you all for being with us again tonight. My pleasure. Have a good evening.